Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. This evening, I'm in conversation with Joanne Millington. Joanne Millington is a forensic scientist and has been in practice for almost 30 years, worked for the Forensic Science Service, and now in private practice at Millington Hingley. And um, you may well have seen Jo Millington on the TV. Uh, she's involved in a trustee at Inside Justice, this miscarriage of justice organization, which in fact has a program on Netflix called Convictions. Um, presented by Louise Shorter, Correct, yes. um, who used to be a producer on Rough Justice. Uh, so this evening, the focus is less on the law and DNA, more on practice. And really, what, what is DNA about? And how do you interpret DNA? And dealing with DNA and, and jury. So the big question, and, and really... Um, the research in America recently has shown that juries um, put DNA evidence as the number one most powerful piece of evidence, whereas witness testimony is right down at the bottom of the pile. And no doubt that's probably due to crime scene investigate CSI programs, which seem to suggest that once you find DNA, it's open and shut. So this evening, um, with the help of Joanne Millington, we're going to talk about whether DNA is infallible. So should we start by, is DNA a smoking gun in a case? Well, it's an interesting question because I suppose it depends who you are as to how you answer that question. And as a forensic scientist, I think the answer is no, it's not. DNA is much more complex than that in terms of understanding how it got there, where it came from, in what form it is, and also the method by which it was transferred between individuals. So the, it's much more nuanced than if you get DNA in a case, it means someone did it. Uh, but do you think that the developments in DNA um, are creating more problems than they're solving? They are in a way. I mean, over my career, the development in DNA technology has been unbelievable. So as an example, when I started in the kind of mid late nineties, then we would need a really significant amount of material from which to generate a DNA profile. So let's just start with the basics then. When you say a significant amount of material, what, what, what are you looking for? What really um, are you looking, what sort of material are you talking about? So we're talking about biological material, so blood, saliva, skin cells, semen, things like that. So they will contain DNA. And from that material, we can extract DNA profiles. And you know, that if you read the old textbooks, then you used to need sort of a two pence piece, 50 pence piece sized blood stain in order to do any tests on it. Now we can generate DNA profiles practically from air, from so, very little. Material. So when people talk about touch DNA or trace DNA, what, what, what's that? Yeah, so trace DNA is a much more accurate term than touch DNA because touch suggests it's been transferred through contact. So we use the term trace DNA to encompass all of those amounts of DNA that are not readily visible to the naked eye. These are the things that are just on the background surfaces, things that we just simply, we don't know the form in which that DNA took. And um, has DNA, I mean, the sensitivities, uh, the, the developments in DNA and the process by which you can retrieve DNA. Um, the, the techniques are much more sensitive now than they were before. Far more sensitive. And, and how has that helped? Or has that impeded in the process? Well, in many cases, it's impeded the kind of the usefulness of DNA because it generates DNA mixtures very easily. So as an example, if we put blood into a test tube in order to extract DNA, we would hope that we would get a full DNA profile from that sample. And that full DNA profile would then be compared to a reference profile. But in many cases, when we have a blood swab. So just pause there. So when you talk about 
DNA profile and a reference profile. So in, in lay terms, what, what, what are the two comparisons? So a DNA profile that we generate from a crime scene stain, as an example, will be compared to any individual in a case from whom we have their reference DNA. And if the two match, then of course, that person could be a donor or contributor to that DNA profile. So in this particular case, if now, if we swab a small blood stain from a surface, there's a very high chance that we'll generate a DNA mixture. Now that's completely not what we were hoping so, for because we'd hoped that blood gave a good profile. So when you talk about a DNA mixture, um, a mixture in the context of what? So it's a mixture of DNA from more than one person. And that starts to muddy the waters a little bit. And especially is complicating when we don't know what it is that went into the test in the first place. If we don't have blood or we don't have semen or we don't have saliva, perhaps we've just swabbed the door handle or an area just to see what might be present then it's in those contexts when a DNA mixture can be really tricky to untangle. So how do you ensure there's the reliability um, when dealing with a mixture? Well, we have software available now, which is effectively a black box, really, to, for all intents and purposes, where we place DNA mixture information, all of these numbers and data, go into the computer and it spits out effectively a number which considers whether or not a particular individual might be considered a contributor of DNA. And so the fact that we've got this technology to detangle complexity beyond effectively the, the ability of the person means that we're in an area where we need to be very, very careful about what that DNA means in the context of the questions that the courts would like to answer. So what, when you say the D, what DNA means, what is the DNA? I mean, give an example, please, of what the DNA means in any given circumstance. So as an example, if we generate a DNA profile which matches an individual, then of course they could be that donor of that DNA, but we really need to dig deeper. That's not the end of the journey. We need to think, what does that DNA mean in the context of the case? How did it get there? When did it get there? And the circumstances under which it was deposited? Because in crime investigation, they're the three questions that really are key in the context of the court. And looking at, uh, and just dealing with cases, and we know that um, the, there are streamlined forensic reports that if you've got a case um, and the prosecution will upload to the digital case system, streamlined forensic reports, which are not statements, yeah. uh, but these are just sort of preliminary yeah, results. Yeah, they're like yeah. a headline. Um, that are flagged up as, um, and what are the dangers? I mean, if, you, if you're defending in cases, what are, red flags or what are the dangers or what should you watch for when identifying you know a streamlined forensic report which um prosecution will say look do you agree with this if you if you, if you have any issue yeah or you challenge this streamlined forensic report you've got to let us know yeah and a lot of the time people seem to sort of just it just it can be ignored not challenged until a little bit later in the day yeah so, that's very common actually to not have SFR evidence in statement form until the very last minute in a trial. So in terms of streamlined forensic reports, they were introduced essentially to kind of speed through the process a little bit because historically we would have a lot of exhibits submitted to the laboratory. We'd take our time, we'd look through them methodically. And then at the very end, we'd write a report. But of course in that's no good to the investigator. They want the results when they're available on a you know, quick basis. So these SFRs satisfy that sort of introduction of results into an investigation tie in a timely manner. But the difficulty with SFRs is they don't tell you what the evidence means. So they, as an example, they might say, we've generated a DNA match and, it, and it's nominated this individual, but it doesn't tell you 
or evaluate that result in the context of any allegation that's been made necessarily or an alternative scenario that's been provided by the defence. So the, there's not a sort of holistic approach that's been looked at. Yeah. So, okay, may say that there's blood on the trainers. Yeah. But not looked at it in the context of what um, the defendant has said in, in his interview or in his defence statement. Yeah. So as an example, the presence of blood on a training shoe doesn't necessarily mean that they've assaulted someone. It could have dripped on there inadvertently because they were at the scene but not involved. So that evaluation of the findings is really important. And I've got a case example that shows you how SFR evidence can be misconstrued. So um, if we um, look at this case in terms of our forensic reports useful. So this was a case example where um, the wearer of this coat was um, robbed. And during that altercation, their coat was ripped and that coat went into the laboratory for analysis and a swab was taken from the area where the damage had occurred. And that swab was submitted for DNA profiling and the results were conveyed in the form of an SFR report, a streamlined forensic report. And the edited highlights of that report told the reader that cellular material from the area of the damage had been recovered and had generated by a police unit a match to a particular individual. And these streamlined forensic reports, they, they typically provide an indicative match probability. That's telling you the kind of the strength of the match that's been obtained. And in this particular case, it told us that the match, the indicative match probability was one in a billion. And anybody that deals with DNA evidence will think that's pretty good. I mean, that's the absolute max. You know, that's the gold standard effectively of DNA evidence. We're all familiar with the billion and what that, what that means. So to the reader, that seems like it's generated a match to an individual. That individual has questions to answer and, you know, the, the trial progressed. It wasn't challenged initially in terms of the match, it was just accepted. So the streamlined forensic report was allowed to just remain as it, it just was. Just permeated the, the pre-trial um, period, yeah. And, and on, when this case was reviewed by ourselves, then um, we then, that's when the DNA match was challenged and we asked for the records in relation to that match. So what stage did you come into the process? Pretty late, not, not long before trial. And when the SFR is challenged, that initiates the next phase. So essentially the DNA result will be passed to a scientist for further analysis and evaluation. Remember these SFRs or many of these SFRs are issued by DNA administration units who, who are kind of staffed by non-DNA scientists. So when you came into the case, what and you you saw the streamlined forensic report what did it throw up for you well nothing really because at first blush it looked pretty good i mean it looked like dna matching this individual was on this coat and there's a match probability of a billion so it sounds like it's a one-way ticket obviously we need to think about how that dna got there but that's transfer and persistence that's not dealt with in SFR. but then you were obviously provided with the defense perspective well, before even that stage arrived, then um, when we saw the result, we determined that it was actually a mixture of DNA. And this is an extract from the report that was written by the scientist on the Crown side who reviewed that result on behalf of the um, Crown. And they established that it was a mixed DNA result indicating the presence of DNA from at least six people. And because of the complexity of that result, because our software cannot cope with that complexity, it puts this DNA profile, this mixed DNA profile into the realms of it's not suitable for statistical analysis. We can't do anything with it. So the SFR evidence, which went from one in a billion has been dissolved into a complex mixture 
that we don't have the capability to interpret and it's an unsuitable non-evidential DNA result. So that didn't form part of the case? It can't, yeah. it's got no evidential basis. No statistical evaluation. Yeah, and that obviously is where SFR evidence falls down because if that challenge is not placed early enough in the process or it's accepted at face value, you don't get that complexity and that understanding of what that DNA actually means. So, so what are you saying to those that are defending? Challenge a streamlined forensic report. Yeah, if, if your client is not accepting the presence of DNA or the DNA has a role to play in your case, challenge, challenge, Denies. challenge. And the other um, issue in which um, SFR evidence can kind of throw you a little bit of a curveball is that it will stop short of evaluating the findings in the context of the allegation. So essentially, if we have a situation where, as an example, we have blood on clothing, it might tell us that there is blood present and it might tell us who that blood could have come from but there might be a, a kind of sneaky little sentence at the end saying, if you'd like us to think about this blood in the context of the activities that are alleged, let us know. <laughs> and if you don't let us know, then you don't get that kind of second wave of interpretation. So the streamlined forensic reports do not provide a holistic approach because obviously they're just looking at it from one angle. That's right. They haven't looked at it from the defence perspective. Yeah. So they're not able to have that overall evaluation. Yeah, and the consideration of scientific findings in the absence of an alternative, such as if you have a no comment interview, can be very dangerous indeed. Because any finding in the context of no comment, as an example, blood on a training shoe, could be because they did what was alleged. I kicked someone. What, 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 what tends to happen is that the streamlined forensic report, unless it's challenged, it will end up as a potentially as an agreed fact come yeah, the trial. Exactly. Because if you're not challenging it, the prosecution think that you're accepting the fact as in the streamlined forensic report. Yeah. And it's sure comes very late in the day when yeah yeah and and again if you have not had that communication with your scientist and ask them to consider their findings in the context of the defense alternative they've only looked at it from from one side of the coin that can lead to really um misleading strengths of support for the for the allegation so I'll give you an example of that. So in this no comment case example, the clothing of the suspect was examined and blood staining was found. And that blood staining was evaluated without there being a defense alternative, just simply did this individual assault, stab in this case, the deceased. So if you evaluate the findings any findings in without having that balance, you could effectively get a report that says, well, one explanation for those blood findings could be that they assaulted the person as alleged, because obviously that's one explanation, but it's not the full story. So if you have a report where your science has been evaluated without that full balance, that full case context, you're really missing where the balance lays. So in this particular case, this individual who had blood from the deceased on their clothing, they gave an account that they'd actually help paramedics remove that injured party from their car. So of course, in that context, the blood could have transferred because of what they're saying. So now that what seemed like very strong evidence of, of assault suddenly becomes neutralized into, well, actually the findings are inconclusive. So just beware of, of cases where you haven't had that full evaluation. And if you read a report where the scientist has not yet had the defense case statement, try and get that to them at the earliest convenience because you won't know the full picture until that happens.
just dealing with um, <clears throat> the issue of does, does every contact leave a trace of DNA <laughs> or is that? Well, that's the basis for, for forensic science, yeah? So Edmund Locard said it does. Every contact leaves a trace. I make a, I make a career out of it. But, it, but it doesn't because we know that you can handle things without leaving your DNA. We know that we can um, move DNA from A to B without necessarily the donor of that DNA knowing anything about it. Oh, <clears throat> so it's a very nuanced and complicated statement. We've heard statement. about secondary transfer in cases. So you could, um, of course, like I could shake your hand and you could that carry my damage. DNA and go to the pub and have a drink of gin, gin and tonic and my DNA could be on that glass and I've never set foot in the pub. So, yeah. I mean, that sort of secondary transfer, indirect transfer. I mean, <clears throat> is that becoming more likely nowadays in light of the sensitivities? Well, it's um, difficult to exclude. If you get the, the appropriate conditions under which DNA can transfer inadvertently, and the level of DNA detected is at trace level, then those types of mechanisms can't be robustly excluded. And so in some cases, the presence of DNA does not necessarily mean they were there or they handled an item, as an example. And just dealing with, um, I mean, just dealing with red flags, okay? What are the, the red flags when you're looking at DNA? Well, there are a few. I mean, the, the, the transfer and persistence is a, is a, is a massive hot topic at Those the moment. Those are obviously big labels, but what, what, what do they actually mean? Well, the, the, the red flags for anyone who deals with DNA evidence are where do the strengths lie and where do the limitations lie? And if you have a report where it hasn't been clarified what the source of that DNA is or it hasn't been addressed how it might have been transferred, then you really need to ask questions about that to understand whether it actually means anything in the context of your case. And I'll give you an example from a body-worn video case because we now have technology available at crime scenes as an example. So that what you mean by body-worn footage is, you know, the police are able now to video or have a camera on them yeah. and, and you can actually watch the police officer at the scene walking around. It can be very, very useful because it can demonstrate activities and movements that have taken place before the scene has been locked down and placed under crime scene control. So body worn video in most cases that certainly I deal with, uh, I would always ask for that to try and understand if someone's been moved or if there's been items that have been shifted around before evidence recovery. And the reason it's important is because once the crime scene tape goes up, we have safe procedures and safety nets around what's happened there. But before that crime scene tape, then there are activities that are going on that are actually undermining DNA evidence. So if we look through this case, this is a case where um, there was a, a individual was found inside this um, a flat within this block. He'd been um, stabbed and he was essentially in bed. So um, when the police attended this um, scene, then they were given an account from the next door neighbor. And in fact, this is a, a photograph taken from their living room, looking at the into the backyard of this apartment. And they said that they saw an assault take place in this backyard during which they saw an individual being kicked to the head. And they said they described the kicking as equivalent of the, the assailant taking a penalty kick in football. So it seemed like it was a really significant attack. And the um, police officers obviously attended the scene and these are just snapshots from the body worn camera. So the photograph on the left is a sensitized image of the deceased. He's found in his bed, but you can see a small blue mark in the bottom left corner. That's the hand of one of the officers manipulating the deceased clothing to look for identification. And that 
manipulation takes place over a few minutes. They're turning the body. There are a few officers who are manipulating this individual who has bleeding injuries. And at no time during their access to this scene do they change gloves or clean gloves. And um, the photograph on the right is the another officer sort of touching his brow and kind of thinking about the next step, steps of the investigation. So what were you, was this a case that you were involved in? Yeah. And yeah. so what were the implications? I mean, how did, well, did all this of, contamination affect? All of these actions are moving DNA from A to B to C to D. And so if there's no kind of situation in the, in the middle where gloves are changed or cleaned, you just really, you've got, you've got it's running amok throughout this crime scene. So in this particular case, they um, found, this is above a washing machine, and this is a blood stain that was found on the tiled wall of a, of a washing machine. And if you look at the blood stain patterns, anybody watching this might think to themselves, well, I could kind of guess how that blood stain was created. I mean, it looks like it's the shape of a hand. In fact, if I said it is the shape of a hand, you might even think to yourself, mm -hmm. well, looks like a right hand, whether you're trained in blood stain patterns or not. And in fact, that's exactly what the officer thought because they placed their own hand over the foot over the um, blood stain at the scene. Now, this individual has been manipulating the body, has been checking for identification. And so in transferring material from the body to the handprint, which potentially could have been left by the assailant, they could be moving DNA into that space and vice versa. The same officer is then seen and captured interviewing um, at the scene one of the witnesses. Now the neighbor um, from which we've seen their um, view from their living room said that in this altercation, there was a woman in a red coat involved in that assault. And if, if that's correct, then this officer is ostensibly interviewing a woman in a red coat. So we've got complete transfer potentially of material from the crime scene, from the deceased, and potentially to a person of interest. So how, how do you guard against this situation since the police are the first on the scene? They get the well, it's very difficult. I mean, scene. it's really difficult to do because obviously they're level of understanding of DNA and their actions is perhaps not necessarily at the forefront of the mind when they're in the throes of investigation. But from this point onwards, DNA is undermined. And, and if you think about then the fact that we might take lots of samples from this crime scene to try and in, investigate and in, um, identify individuals that were there, suddenly we're in a, a very difficult spot indeed. I mean, are they meant to not um, touch anything, wait for the forensic scientists to come along. I mean, how would you, what would you suggest? I mean, Certainly they need to be changing gloves. If they're, if they're manipulating an individual who is heavily bloodstained, they shouldn't be wearing those gloves in dealing with other evidence types. So, you know, that's just, that's just basic. But the fact that it hasn't happened means that later down the line, when we're trying to extrapolate information from very complex mixtures, it just demonstrates how how difficult it is to be definitive about anything because of these uncertainties along the track. And was this an issue during the course of that case? Yeah, and absolutely. And in what way did it impact? Well, it means that if a swab is recovered from, let's say, the handprint at the scene, and that demonstrates DNA that is anything other than the victim, because we anticipate it's his blood in which there is this hand mark, any other DNA is likely to be considered, could that have been put down by the person placing down that handprint? And now we have that uncertainty about any trace level of DNA within that result could be contamination. So it's just something to bear in mind because body-worn video is a really rich source of information when considering these types of questions. Um, apart from this whole issue of contamination, does um, the body worn footage help you? I mean, obviously going to the scene, you don't always go to the scene. That's right. Um, and so looking, for example, at sort of blood spatter or blood pattern analysis, um, you can be reliant on photographs. 
we the often, quality of the photographs. Yeah, we often review cases from photographs. In fact, many scientists do. I mean, in terms of blood stain pattern analysis, which is the distribution of blood at a, a particular site and what that might mean, in order to be able to evaluate BPA, blood stain pattern analysis, um, you need to see the pattern, obviously, to interpret it. So if the records aren't looking at that pattern in a way that is useful and meaningful in the context of BPA, then there's no way that we can do anything with it. So you'd be looking for always the blood from an artery, for example. Yeah, there are lots well, of mechanisms. From a superficial yeah. wound. Yeah. I mean, spatter, which is obviously droplets of blood, they are distributed by various mechanisms, one of which is I've got some blood and I hit it and it becomes spattered in a scene that's impact spatter. It might be flicked from a surface that's mm -hmm. cast up. It might be projected from a damaged artery that's just projected or arterial mm -hmm. damaged blood. All of these patterns sh show characteristics that can allow us to determine the mechanism by which they were created. And some of them can be very helpful. You know, it can tell us where someone was positioned when they were shot, when they were where they were when they were assaulted, where where weapons were swung to create blows. So they can be very helpful, but if the records are insufficient, then they're of no help whatsoever. And of course, if we only test the DNA from a pattern of blood staining, that doesn't tell us how that blood got there. It just tells us who the blood could have originated from. So just dealing with the whole question, I mean, is forensic science infallible? Well, that's obviously you hope that it isn't. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you have to have some faith in forensic science, of course you do, but I think you have to understand the strengths and the limitations. I mean, I just want to um, continue with our journey through the case with the body worn camera because it demonstrates how fragile an interpretation can be when a scientist is involved, because obviously we never give you a definitive answer, right? We're always cagey. We always like hold something back and frustrate the <laughs> frustrate barristers by not giving a yes or a no answer. But the reason for that is we have to couch our conclusions in a very careful way. So as an example, I don't know whether or not people know that we can behave in an investigative manner or an evaluative way. So an investigative scientific opinion is kind of using all of our experience to say I kind of think this could explain it whereas an evaluative approach is considering the findings in the context of two alternative propositions so in this particular case this is the body worn video case the yard that we looked at the backyard this is where this individual the neighbor says that she saw someone being kicked with the ferocity of a penalty kick, then during the examination, a number of blood stains were found on this uh, wheel clamp. And those blood stains were of a, in a pattern that essentially demonstrated or were considered to be impact spatter. The scientist had a look at them. They had been given this information about someone being assaulted in the backyard. They said, well, look at all those drops of blood on that wheel clamp. That's impact spatter. That's the assault site. And nobody had any concerns about that because there's a witness who has effectively had front row seat of this assault. So everybody was like, that's great. Yeah, fine. Fits perfectly. Now, a sample was recovered from that blood staining, and of course, it's not a priority because there was nothing in that question that fell out of place. Why bother testing that blood? Because it's the assault site. We've got a dead guy. It's going to be his blood. And so that DNA test didn't happen until further down the track. All of the priority things happen right at the beginning of an investigation. Other things happen later down the line when kind of washing up loose ends. And in this particular case, they submitted that DNA for testing and the blood did not match 
the deceased. What, what triggered them testing it at that stage? Just washing up the loose ends. Just, just closing off the case. Just so we've got that sample. Let's put it in for analysis. Let's just belt and braces on this. And when it was tested, it didn't match the deceased. So hang on a minute, because if it's the assault site, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And when they re-evaluated the blood pattern in the context of the DNA result, they said, oh, well, in light of the DNA result, this isn't the assault site. And that kind of is a completely the wrong way to approach it because the pattern of blood stains should have told them if it was impact batter or not, but they effectively put two and two together and got six and everything sort of fell into so place. So what was it? Well, it was just literally a drip pattern, somebody dripping blood and these little tiny droplets projecting back onto this wheel, wheel clamp. So that DNA now suddenly identifies another player and that player was captured on CCTV moments after this assault. Now, because <clears throat> we're months down the line, that individual's clothing is no longer available, the clothing that they wore on the night of the attack. So they then had to look at CCTV footage to try and understand whether or not they were bloodstained at the point at which this assault took place moments afterwards. And this is just a snapshot of the CCTV image of this individual. Now, if we're asked to consider, is this person bloodstained? you can see quite clearly that it's an absolutely impossible question to answer. So the fact that we had this kind of, the, the findings were being led by the information provided to the scientist at the scene. And that management of information and that bias is, is really important in investigations. And if we get it wrong, we have to be really careful or we, it's not that we get it wrong, we have to be really careful at how we convey our certainty around an interpretation. So what, what are the, the lessons then in relation to, from both sides, you're prosecuting a case and you've got DNA, what are the real factors? What do you really need to look for? What do you need to be careful of? What yeah, do you need to... Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a scientist, so I don't prosecute cases at all. But I think if I was a prosecuting barrister, I would want to know what my scientist is going to say. So I would lay out the questions that I want to ask this individual and understand if their reports answer those questions. If I ask them, who did the DNA match? That's probably going to be in the SFR. If I want to know how did that DNA get there, that's unlikely to be in the SFR. So I would go back to that individual and say, look, I want to ask you these questions. What do you need to do in order to be able to do that? Because the absolute last place you want to be asking a scientist an evaluative question or a contextual question is in the witness box. That's the most dangerous and unsafe place for a scientist to evaluate complex scientific evidence. You want to know before then what they're going to say, and they need to have the time and space to consider that question in the safety of the laboratory, where they've got peer review and independent checks and all the other things that give you an assurance that your scientist is is giving a really good and robust answer. And from the defence perspective, I know that you said earlier on that you know everything seems to be very last minute, and you, as the scientist instructed by the defence, seem yeah. to be getting everything really, yeah. you know, the last minute and having to write these very complex reports, you know, up against the clock. Yeah. But what 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 is it that the defence, you know, have to be wary of? What what are you know, we talked about streamlined forensic reports and you know that's a red flag and to challenge 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 yeah what what else do you think is important on that journey and, and you know to avoid the assumptions and to avoid that you know knee-jerk reaction mm. um that, well the you know, same DNA applies is... on the other side right you want to know what your scientist is going to say about the evidence so first of all you need to communicate with that individual and give them advice and instruction in relation to 
to your key issues. That's really important because if you think about a murder investigation, the timeline of that can be months to years from a prosecution perspective. If you expect a defense scientist to be able to assimilate, review and comment on 18 months worth of scientific evidence the week before trial, it's not gonna happen. So, you know, it's just simply not possible. So I think it's really key to think about what your issues are and instruct your scientist in a way that allows them to understand that so that they can distill all of that noise and kind of cut through it and get to the issues that you're going to want answers to. Because obviously the Crown, if they've been given the space to write a full witness statement, they should have comprehensively and clearly led you through all of the information that's available. That's the library of it all. But there might only be one or two inf you know, results or items that are key in the context of your client. So I would almost certainly try and have a conversation with your scientist and, and sort of focus them in so that they're, they're on the same sheet of music, really. And what, what do you see, I mean, day in, day out in the job that you're doing, the, the problems that you face, the, the problems that you're presented with, apart from getting instructions at the last minute, what, what do you see that the problems are being faced in the courtroom in the context of DNA? What do you think change, there are changes needed? Well, I think I would, I think my colleagues would agree that 80% of the DNA cases that we look at, perhaps even more, are usually around what the DNA means in the context of the allegation. We know who it matches. We're happy with the statistic. It's then a case of what does it actually mean? And, and the when you say what does it actually mean, like how it got there? How, when, when got... why, what? Yeah. Or what, why, when, how? Yeah. <laughs> They're all the same thing. They're all asking, what does it mean now that we found it? And sometimes you can't really answer those questions because it can be that sort of trace. And, and very often we can't answer those questions, but it's important that you know that and not, not think that it is going to be that smoking gun that we talked about right at the start. And have you got any other? Just yeah, I, I had examples. So. I had a, I had a question. So um, <laughs> do great minds think alike? So this was really my question to you, because obviously, you know, as a as a as a as a lawyer, you obviously have a very like detailed understanding of your case and a scientist. You may instruct a scientist and they obviously have a very you know deep understanding of the science. But are we actually speaking the same language? Are we thinking in the same ways? And I just wondered if there's any kind of tips as to how we can come together and get more from yes, I mean, a case where there is forensic evidence. I think it's really important that the scientist has that holistic approach that is being given as much information rather, looking, rather than looking at things from just one really sort of narrow angle, um, you know, has that wider picture. And, and so I think, the advice that goes to the forensic scientist about this is what the case is about this is what we want to look at this is the focus please take a focused approach but in the sense of taking a focused approach you must understand what what it's all about um so you can properly evaluate it and you know that using that word holistic approach so you're not later when you're in the witness box oh well i wasn't aware of that um so i do think um detailed instructions detailed advice that goes to you um of course a, a conference yeah i find those really mm. important and helpful actually and not just before i'm about to step into the courtroom <laughs> you know i would <laughs> yes. i would prefer it if we had a conversation mm. even if it's just a few minutes on the telephone during you know once that report has mm. been written because I can't change the, the, mm. the, the, the outcome of the evaluation, but it's certainly helpful to have that discussion about what it actually means. For my part, I like to, because I'm old fashioned, I like to be in the room with the expert and I like to say, and it, 
it, you, you're the expert, I'm not. And it's really, it can take a couple of hours to say, I really don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, not to be frightened to say that and say, really need to understand it. Because if I understand it, then I can communicate it to the jury. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so it doesn't matter if in that room, in that conference, I'm asking you questions that may seem simple to you, but I have to understand it so that everybody else understands it and I can ask you the right questions. So yes, I, I get a lot out of those conferences. Um, and I just think that people don't need to be, certainly your lawyers need to feel that they can ask you and they can say, right, um, let's talk in simple language. Because you sometimes do get with experts, they've got their own language and all the fancy words. And you think, no, we, we've got to get rid of that. OK, and we've just got to, it's simple, straightforward. So people understand what you're saying, because it's, it's, it's gone in a flash, isn't it? You give your so much information in the courtroom mm. and um, they only get to hear it once the jury and then they've heard a lot of detail and then suddenly experts come along and there's you know the jargon and of course it's for the lawyer to ensure that that's broken down and made um, you know simple and so people can pick it up yeah. in that one go. I think sometimes also it's about dispelling the myths of forensic science because I understand you know that juries have a, a very sort of broad understanding of forensic science from the media and so I think in a lot of cases it's about dispelling the the kind of the the, the assumptions about what forensic science can tell us and trying to focus in on the limitations more than the strengths in some cases. So in terms of is DNA and is forensic science infallible, then we probably haven't answered the question. Have we? we probably <laughs> said no, it isn't. Yeah. So it has um, its limitations. Shall we um, open, up. open up to Q and A? So there's been a question on the chat. Okay, wonderful. Um, from Paul Gallagher, which actually has possibly also been answered on the chat by Lynn Pingley, okay. who's, who's hopped in with okay. <laughs> But the question is, recently instructed in the possession of scorpion gun case used in two shooting, my client's a drug user and is a close associate of the person whose DNA has been found on the gun, wrapping and rucksack. My client's DNA on the internal receiver, crown say indicative of minding or moving it. SFR says mixed, slash full 32 slash 32 DNA 17 and say 1 billion to 1. Early staging case and I view the potential for secondary transfer given the close association to the other male. Any thoughts on that? He goes on to say I will be looking to instruct the DNA expert after prison visit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, 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 <laughs> so, so our email is mail at <laughs> <million>. <laughs> No, but I mean, it's absolutely a, a, a question that you absolutely must ask in terms of DNA transfer and persistence. So um, the interesting thing is it should be done in conjunction with a ballistics expert. So um, That's exactly what and Lynn so get a firearms expert because this yeah. internal part might not be internal. Because there are some firearms when uh, in which the ostensible interior or inside surfaces are actually uh, visible or available externally. So it's really important that we get the notes, the examination notes from that item to understand how they accessed that internal surface and understand the me mechanics of that particular firearm. So the, the information that you've provided, and, and Lynn has obviously answered a lot of your questions, is that you absolutely need to address transfer and persistence. I, I, was, um, I was going to... Hi, ask... sorry to interrupt. It's, it's Mr oh. Gallagher. Are you OK? Hi, Gallagher. Hi. It's Paul, Paul Gallagher. Um, hi, yeah. Paul. Hi. Thanks very much for answering the question. Um, I've also just followed it up that... Um, the, the, the scorpion gun sort of detaches and I've been set, sent a picture of the, the gun, you know, together as well as, yeah. you know, it detached. And it, it's, it, it is in, it's, it's internal as if someone could have picked it up. But of course, if, if my, if I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with this fellow drug user doing whatever, 
um, with him. Yeah. There's a possibility that my drug user friend, who clearly has been storing it, may have had it stored in two parts in any event before it was recovered yeah. in full. So, yeah. you know, I, I think there's still, you know, arguably um, um, room for secondary transfer, especially if they're using yeah. you know, drug, drug, you know, drug, drug stuff between. But as I say, I'm going to see him tomorrow and it may well be that he turns around and says, I have touched it and that's the end of that. Um, but, well, you know, I, I just wanted to, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. we put a bail application and hammering that point and of, uh, yeah, of course, yeah. because it's you, been... You want to know uh, where, where the DNA matching your client sits in that mixture. So he might be a very trace level contributor or he might be the major contributor. And that will be evident in the DNA work that's been done. And that's something that you need to take account of when considering issues about secondary transfer or tertiary transfer or generically indirect transfer. Thank you, Paul. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of I'll prior authority and send you an email, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank Thanks. you. Okay. Bye. Can I ask in that scenario where you had the one billion to one? Yes. But then it was completely kicked out um, for lack of. Um, well, it was more complex than that. That. So the other contributors would would you have expected their DNA if an SFR had been produced? For their references to say the same thing, one in a billion. Or... Well, we 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 don't necessarily. It was so complicated that we couldn't actually understand if someone was a contributor or not. So because they were only looking at that result in the context of that individual, then it generated the match. But actually, in reality, we couldn't separate out the individual components and understand which bit went with who. So it, it's just way too complicated to but understand. Why is that enough to leave someone in, evidentially? Because if it's not suitable for a statistical evaluation, it doesn't have any evidential value. So if you um, remember, qualitative DNA evaluation was had a, a short life in the court. So we were able to say, it, for results that were very complicated and weren't suitable for statistics, we were able to look at the reference profile of an individual and compare it qualitatively to the soup of DNA that was available and say, who looks like they might be in there, but not give that number to kind of back it up. Then, then the Douglas and the Pickering hearings and uh, rulings allowed that to happen. But now we've understood that if we can't if we can't do a statistic around that DNA finding, then we shouldn't rely on the qualitative opinion. And the that's, back that's very much the scientific forensic regulator has made that very clear. Yeah, in a number of reports. And the reason for that is because if you have a very complex mixture of DNA and you send it blindly to ten different scientists and ask them if this individual might be a contributor you're going to get 10 different answers because mm. that qualitative approach mm. to it is, 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 is no longer accepted practice. So if your DNA profile doesn't have a number with it, then, and you, you should challenge it. I, I was going to answer a question um, based on my experience in some quite complex DNA in a very historic cold case murder I was involved in recently, and I was very interested in that case with actually the amount of subjectivity involved in yes. assessing mixed samples. And I was a little surprised, and I don't know whether this is something that's contemplated, but that when, when one was looking at some of the language, uh, X is a possible contributor, or it's not possible to, to say whether or not someone is a, that there was, seemed to me very specific language being used by the scientist, yeah. but not absolute clarity about what the different phrases meant. Yeah. And the impression I got was that 
and that may be borne out by what you're saying, is scientists have their own, and they're precise in their own language, and it means something to them in the context of all of their analyses. Absolutely. But it might not equate to how another scientist might describe it. And I wondered if you thought there was scope for there being some sort of standardised scale to, to assist in that sort of use of language. Yeah, so uh, the way in which um, DNA results are described is very much down to personal preference in a way or training. So you might have DNA scientists from different forensic science laboratories who have a different approach to the way that they describe what they see. The only way that you can really have a standardized approach to it is when you have a statistic and that statistic is converted into our scientific strength of support, which we, use as a verbal equivalent to represent a number. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of what I'm saying is, is good and makes sense <laughs> because science is obviously very complicated in this respect, but we have a scientific logarithmic scale of support which has words on it like moderately strong, extremely strong. Yes. Yeah, and those words, those phrases have a very specific meaning in the context of statistics. They, each of those phrases represent a range of numbers. So that is the only point at which you're going to get a standardized approach to the term and the number. Any other type of description will be like herding cats. And in fact, I've remembered now why it was so complex, because unusually, I think, in the context of DNA, there was reliance placed on negative findings, but even ordinarily, mm. one's not worried about negative findings, mm. one's looking at the strength of a positive finding sure. in that statistical way, yeah. uh, but where one was actually trying, and there's always a flaw in a negative finding, because as you say, someone might have been in contact and left their DNA, so you can never say for certain just because, you, and you might have tested the wrong bit of material and another bit of material, there might have been exactly. uh, something there. So there were all of those ramifications. Yeah, but yeah. actually in the, in, the, um, in the wording that was being used to describe the different sorts of negative yeah. findings that yeah. there was. The absence of DNA is a really difficult topic because as an example, if I have a knife, which I believe to be the murder weapon, then there is one surefire thing is going to happen to that knife. It is going to be subjected to fingerprint analysis. And yet the first thing that happens is the recovery of samples for DNA testing. And that's done so that we can recover some material and then put the knife in for fingerprints. So when we recover samples from a knife handle, as an example, we do it in a way which preserves the majority of the surface for fingerprints because the last thing we want to do is wipe them off when we're swabbing for DNA. So we actually only sample from really specific areas. We might do around the, the join of the handle. We might look at only little textured areas. So we're taking material from a small fraction of the available surface. So when you then get a DNA result from the handle of the knife and an individual is not represented in that mixture, as an example, someone might say, well, that suggests they didn't handle it. But of course, you're only looking at a really small snapshot of what was there. And fingerprints by far and away are always going to be the go-to evidence type for yes. understanding definitively if somebody handles something or not. Don't ever think really that DNA is going to give you the answer to that question. Okay, is there anybody, any other questions from the room or on the chat? 